Good afternoon, and I want to thank everybody for being here today and braving the weather. Some of us, you can tell some of us aren't from Atlanta, so we're not going home. And don't trust me, we're not punishing y'all for being here, but we're just going to take care of this business because we've got a whole lot of other things on the agenda of this committee. And uh, But I want to, we do have a couple of bills that we're going to move on, and a couple of them we're going to take testimony today. Uh, I'm Alan Powell. Uh, I chair this committee. I'm from Hartwell, Georgia. And if y'all don't know here where Hartwell is, go up I-85 to South Carolina and turn around. You, I represent the 40 miles coming back this way. Uh, but I want you to know it's a pleasure being here. I want to tell you what, for those of y'all who uh, did not have the pleasure of being here last year, the rules that this committee has is pretty well set in stone. Uh, any bill that we have will be properly vetted. Uh, we will have plenty of testimony. We do welcome testimony and any ideas so that we can perfect the bill. Redundancy, unfortunately, on some bills becomes a nature, but we try to be courteous to everybody. What we will not tolerate is some of the actions that uh, uh, previous years, uh, the emotions on some bills saw. Uh, because most of the members of this committee are pretty straightforward, but they also, I think most of the committee members up here also have concealed weapon permits. So we don't adhere to threats too much. Uh, but that being said, welcome to this committee, and I'm going to let those in attendance uh, introduce ourselves. If we would, let's start with the vice chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Representative Darlene Taylor, and I represent <coughs> District 173, which is rural South Georgia, Thomas, Grady, and Decatur County. And I am licensed. Thank you. Well said. Eddie, Eddie Lumsden. Uh, I represent the 12th District, which is uh, northern and western Floyd County and uh, all of Chattooga County. Uh, I'm a retired state trooper, and yes, I carry. I'm Alex Oh, I'm, sorry. Okay. I'm Representative Keisha Waits of the 60th District. I represent most of the metro Atlanta area, Haightville, College Park, East Point, everything surrounding the uh, Hartsfield Atlanta Airport, and I do carry as well. Thank you. Mm. Alex? Representative Alex Atwood represent uh, Glenn County, St. Simons, Jekyll, uh, Brunswick. I'm a retired federal agent. I've been a judge, and I don't tell people whether I carry or not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Bill Hitchens. I represent District 161, which is South Effingham and West Chatham. It's uh, Port Wentworth, Garden City, part of Savannah, and uh, the city of Pooler. I'm the retired Commissioner of Public Safety, uh, formerly the Homeland Security Director, and I, uh, <coughs> I don't tell people what I carry you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen of the committee makes me feel kind of humbled. I feel like I'm very secure amongst y'all. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, first bill up, uh, out of courtesy to Senator Davenport. If you would, come on up, Senator. Uh, just I'll try to help her give the committee for y'all's uh, your knowledge. Senate Bill 23, we passed it out of this committee last year. Uh, it has passed the Senate, obviously, and it, we passed it out of the committee. Representative Jay Neal, former chairman of uh, state institutions, Jay Neal was handling this bill, and and I'm thinking it just got held up into the rules committee in the process last year. It did. And uh, and I can't remember, but I'm presuming that we didn't make any changes in this bill. No. No, uh, because I thought it was pretty well cut and dried. Mm -hmm. Very good bill. We've sort of discussed it up here. But if you want to go through the bill, I mean, it's a straightforward bill, Senator. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To the members of this committee, the Stacey Nicole English Act, uh, it aids uh, in the location of a missing person, a person who may be incapacitated due to a medical condition. This young lady uh, had a medical condition, uh, and uh, the police uh, officers found her car with the keys in and the car running. Uh, and they probably assumed that uh, the car had been stolen. She lived up in the Buckhead area. And they went to her house, which they were, were trying to do, trying to locate her, and they got no answer. 
Uh, but what happened is her body was found days later. Her parents tried to do a missing person report, but you had to wait for it. So this bill really uh, prohibits a minimum waiting period. Uh, for initiating a missing person. And the one thing that this does, um, and I know people have asked about the Maddox call, but one thing that this does is uh, at the time of vehicle registration is to provide a, a emergency contact uh, information for the vehicle application. And we think that that will help save the lives. Uh, her parents uh, um, uh, made statements at the Senate meeting, and they were going to make statements today. And I just talked to them about 50 minutes ago. They had to turn around on 75 because they said the weather was getting too bad and the officers are, were advising everyone to go back that way. But they did want to be here. Good. Any questions from any of the committee members? Well, let's, we're going to take a little testimony to see first. Um, it's, I remember this quite well from last year. I mean, basically it says what it says, and that's at law enforcement agencies. And we know that a lot of age, some agencies and departments have a, a time limit before they'll uh, issue a missing person. And this basically states that they, that they can't have a mandated minimum waiting period if that person has a medical condition. The rest of the bill basically lumps this into the uh, the Maddie's call alert system. Is that correct? That's correct. And I think the last time, Mr. Chairman, that we ha did have some law enforcement to come, and they were okay with the bill. Very good. All right, Senator, if you would, if there's no questions from the panel, I'm going to call it. Does anyone wish to speak for or against this bill? Everybody feel good? Feel warm and cuddly about it? This makes me feel good. All right, this time we'll entertain a motion. Ms. Lakes. Thank you, sir. Recommend do pass. I'll second. We have a recommendation do pass. And we have a second. Last chance. Any further questions? All in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you, Senator. What committees do you serve on in the Senate? Uh, special Judiciary, Veterans, and Military Affairs. And, of course, Appropriations. Very good. Some of us might need to reciprocate if we come to see you <laughs> over in the Senate. I wish you were on public safety and maybe a few of them over there, but maybe you can help us over there with a few things. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. You're welcome to stay if you'd like, or you can... Go. Thank you. All right. Um, Representative Cook, I think he had to go home. Let's bring up his House Bill 807. We don't want to spoil a record of uh, missing a meeting and not discussing something to do with firearms. Uh, House Bill 807 by Representative Cook. This is the fireman's firefighters bill. Uh, basically, it says, with the permission of the local fire department, firefighters as defined in Code Section 25.3-21 should be authorized to carry firearms while on duty as a firefighter. Such firearms may be carried openly or concealed. All right. Any discussion of the committee members? Any thoughts you want to bring forward? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the one question I had had to do with being the de um, fire department. Most of these fire departments are going to be employed by a county or a city or some jurisdiction. Would it perhaps be, be more direct for it to go to them to make that decision and not just the department? Just wondering legal-wise if that's appropriate. I think that is most appropriate. Um, I think that most of the GMA and ACCG folks have had to take a hiatus and get out of here. And, you know, I, I certainly do commend uh, what these guys are doing, and especially in this day and time at where you read where we have firefighters that are called out to a fire and you've got people that are shooting at them and, and the such like that. I have some concerns at one that it was uh, the fire department not be one that makes that decision because of liability. 
I think it would need to go up the chain of command, which would be the fire department's immediate supervision that goes to the up the chain of command to the uh, the governing authority, whether it be a municipal municipality or a county, since they're the ones that are ultimately going to be carrying the liability for this. Um, so that, you know, I think that we can discuss this one. We've got a couple other bills, but we can discuss this one quite frankly. But that's one change that I would certainly think we'd need to make. Um, openly or concealed. I mean, I think there's several things would have to be decided. These firefighters would probably need to also have a weapons permit. Since I don't know, they're not, firefighters aren't post certified, they're firefighter certified. Now, maybe we need to get a little bit more information to be sure that they're, I guess a felon could be a, a firefighter. So we'd need to. I'll tell you what, let me, uh, for the sake of some uh, timing and discussion on this, let me appoint a, uh, a special subcommittee to look at this and meet with them. Would you, uh, Vice Chair, would you be in favor of chairing that and maybe working with uh, Bill? I just saw that look. You ain't got time. <laughs> would you like to be a part of that? I mean, we got another bill that's going to be coming shortly that I'm going to probably need the attorney's advice on. Okay. Bill, would you like to work on this bill? On this, with, uh, oh, really? So you want me to work on the other one? Mm -hmm. I got one that you're going to be working on. I'll explain that one shortly. Uh, Representative Hitchens and you, you represent Waits. Which one of y'all? Would y'all like to serve on that? You're chairman. Which one? How's your time frame working? You like them? Representative Lunston, if the three of y'all might could get look at look this bill over, make some recommendations, and I will uh, let uh, Representative Cook know. And at some point, maybe in the next week or so, y'all can meet with him. And I say that pretty. If y'all could might take a good look at it because we got a another bill that we're going to be dealing with real soon. Uh, it was dropped in today. Last year we had uh, many hours of testimony on the Second Amendment bill. If this might could be cleaned up, this might could be added into that bill. But uh, one, one, one thing, Mr. Chairman, on, on uh, uh, the, the police officers that are carrying, these firefighters are going to be carrying it, therefore if certified on behalf of the county or the city. And one thing we may want to look at is the same requirements that we have for law enforcement Training, that sort of thing. So, mm -hmm. very good. Well, I mean, you're, you're basically having a respondeat superior relationship right. here. So, but uh, y'all got something that y'all can look at and maybe just talk with them and, mm -hmm. and just see. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is something that Mike can add to that omnibus Second Amendment bill. But, uh, and I, I see we have the top cop out there. And if y'all have some recommendations y'all would like to make in that, we'd love to hear it. All right, so we know where we're doing with 807. All right, we've got a couple of bills that we're going to be hearing today. Uh, Representative Dickey, you come forward, House Bill 773. Right Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of committee, uh, HB 773. Um, presently, um, it is illegal to discharge a gun within 50 yards of a public street, highway, or road. Um, and I'm attempting to um, ask your consideration changing this law to avert a potential problem in the shooting sports area of uh, Georgia. Uh, most of the gun ranges uh, in Georgia and virtually all the gun shops either have firing ranges or firing lines or, or bullet test traps uh, within this prohibited 50-yard uh, distance. And uh, it just would be prohibited to, to relocate these facilities. Um, gunsmiths who are unable to uh, test fire or repair uh, guns on the premises would have to take them to um, somewhere else uh, to test them. And... Uh, 
we just can't uh, continue to rely on on um, on um, the the, the uh, discretion of law enforcement. Um, and I I worry uh, in the future, although we have not had any immediate problems, uh, I, I worry in the future about some kind of uh, anti Second Amendment uh, right uh, groups or somewhere. Um, that would uh, use this as an anti-gun tool uh, or an existing st uh, statute that would allow um, to shut down some gun ranges and, and testing of guns within this 50-yard um, thing. So I'm, I'm asking uh, to see if we can fix that. I've also included um, legal hunting uh, within this bill. It's very difficult as a hunter. Uh, to determine where this exact yardage is when you're hunting uh, quail or, or dove or any other type of game. Um, DNR is happy with this. Um, it's uh, in, in my mind, as a hunter, uh, I'd rather be closer to a road shooting away from the road, knowing uh, where the road is instead of 50 yards or more within within some acreage and, and the possibility of shooting back toward a road. So DNR, I think, is... Uh, Fine. This does not override or affect any other type of hunting regulations. Um, you know, we have many instances where there is illegal uh, type hunting. This does not uh, affect it at all. If you look at the bill on lines um, uh, 31 is where I put in uh, four exemptions um, for this bill of uh, indoor and outdoor shooting ranges. Facilities for firearm and hunting safety courses um, and um, retail uh, locations of someone selling and then, of course, legal hunting. Um, so, um, you know, legal justification is, is in the statute and it's very ambiguous about uh, what legal justification is on discharging firearms. So I am wanted to exempt these four uh, from it. And... Um, and that's simply all the all the uh, bill does. I think I uh, had some questions from municipal association, Mr. Chairman, about uh, whether it would override any existing municipal. Uh, if it's illegal, it's still illegal. You know, it, this just clarifies uh, making um, uh, within this 50-yard thing for these exemptions. And I'll be open to some questions. All right. Questions. Questions from the committee. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. And I and I certainly don't have a problem with the general gist and the idea of the bill. I would like to ask that uh, you know if you've got a, a public roadway, sometimes people do make errors in judgment. Yeah. Instead of shooting away from the roadway, they might see say someone was deer hunting, and instead of shooting away from that highway, backed up to the highway or the public roadway. Right. And so they had their deer stand or their blind. Well, normally you'd think they ought to be shooting away from the highway. But say a buck jumps into the road. They're going to probably be tempted. To It'd be them. illegal to shoot across the road. It would be illegal. But what I'm thinking is should we not have some sort of develop some language in here to state that if you are within that 50 yards that you're shooting away or at least a certain degree away from that road. And I say that for the prosecutorial part of making a charge by, say, a DNR or a law enforcement officer, that if that person gets excited or if they're shooting down the road, I mean, that's not what you want because even not even speaking of a, of a rifle slug, but say a, a double off buck shot. Yeah. Didn't do a sizable amount of damage to a truck coming up a road. You know, so should we not possibly consider some language that to spell out that you can be within that fifty yards, but you need to be at a certain angle or a degree away from that public road? We could look at it. I think it'd be a little difficult unless you put uh, maybe hunting at it. 25 yards or 50 yards, but if you still want it, um, you know, now you, 
even with a high power rifle, 50 yards is nothing. You could still be 50 yards in the thin and shooting back toward toward the road, and and, and 50 yards would would. So so I, I'm thinking, it, uh, in my mind, Mr. Chairman, it, it some gives folks, a hundred right, more. Frank, to some folks that go deer hunting, it'd be a whole lot nicer if you pulled that truck up and got out of that truck and jumped <laughs> over the ditch and climbed up your stand and you're hunting away from the road. Yeah, but I think, it, in my opinion, I, I'm, I, my opinion, it gives the hunter much more awareness of where that road is if he's then then he would be 50 yards within within the track or, or where he's hunting. I'll do whatever you, you, you think best. Uh, That's just the will of the committee. That was just a thought that I had had. But, uh, Any questions of the committee? For clarity, law enforcement officials would be exempt, correct? No. No. But, but I would well, think that any law... You mean on duty? Correct, on duty. It, Mr. Dorling, uh, the the law says now if if for any reason it's illegal to discharge a gun within 50 yards by anybody, law enforcement, it doesn't matter. If they're on duty? Uh, for any reason. Well, if a law enforcement officer is on duty and in pursuit of their duties, they're certainly exempt. Well, you know, I, you know it, it gets back to the uh, wording in the bill, what is legal justification? Now, law enforcement may be putting down a, 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 a rabid uh, dog or, or raccoon is that legal justification I don't know and it's not clear within the statutes so yes I've had a sheriff in Bibb County say he's concerned for his law enforcement in the future or something if they were to dis discharge a gun within 50 yards if it was not l under legal justification which is not defined so uh, yeah, it, it doesn't matter uh, whether you're on duty, off duty, or law enforcement or not. Uh, that's what the law says. Discharge of a gun. So this is trying to clarify it in these four instances. All right. All right. Any other questions from the committee? Want to have any other further thoughts about that, Representative Hitchens? I only have one question. And have you thought about perhaps his grandfather and those uh, shooting ranges and all that are in place now, and, <clears throat> and not uh, open it up so that new people would come in and build facilities in close proximity to the road? Well, I think. Uh, thank you for that. We did consider that, but I think uh, in this day and time, in, in urban areas with uh, shooting ranges uh, in existing buildings uh, that the very appropriate place indoor uh, with all the protections that, that indoor ranges have uh, even industrial areas my gun ranges is an, is an industrial area and um, it's, it's closer than 50 yards and so it would really make it uh, much more difficult siding some places in the future uh, would be my thought and indoor it doesn't really doesn't really matter why you're 50 yards from a road I, you know, I live out in the country like you yeah. do, and every uh, every Thanksgiving and Christmas they have a turkey shoot about uh, a half mile down the road, and I can distinctly hear them shooting, and I'm not afraid that they're going to shoot in my direction, but certainly it uh, it disturbs me sometimes, and I've never said anything because they're a yeah. great group and they're doing it for a good cause, but, you know, if I lived in town and lived in close proximity to one, yeah. of course, 50 yards, it could make that much difference, yeah. but... Well, a lot of municip most all of municipalities uh, got restrictions about where you can right. shoot and where you right. can't, and this mm -hmm. does not override and no intention right. of overriding any existing regulation, laws, or ordinances. Any other questions? that would just on the question of, on law enforcement. There, there is well codified, codified in law a legal justification, law enforcement necessity, such as driving fast to chase a speeder, uh, buying drugs undercover, and other things. So that that would not okay. be a problem with your bill. It's okay. well codified. Okay. Uh, in addressing Chairman Powell's concerns, there may be a way, and I, I would leave it up to the author, there may be a way to, to uh, add some verbiage along the lines of uh, 
that it uh, that you would uh, that you must fire away from an existing roadway unless you're in a um, uh, a sh enclosed shooting range or within a burn that would prevent a projectile from crossing out of the boundaries of the range itself and the or the building itself. Something like that is my yeah. thoughts. Just a suggestion to well, you. We might could put uh, that in some DNR regulations. Mm -hmm. uh, might be appropriate place. Mm -hmm. Just trying Possibly. to help you along there a little bit. Yeah. I thought about it. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Tell you what, at the Wisdom of the Committee, we're going to hold this bill because I think we're going to have plenty of time. Um, and if you might could work, maybe think about that language. I will talk to some of the DNR because I don't see any of our DNR people here today. Okay. And they're probably gone. Ask them about that and the possibility about the possibility of rule and reg so we can make a reference to it. Okay. <clears throat> and then we'll, Good suggestion. Then we'll handle this bill first thing when okay. we come back. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Oh. All right. Mr. Benton, we've got a simple little old bill here that uh, we've been getting a little bit of a uh, a little bit of a uh, feedback on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, for all in the audience that are planning on going up to Chairman Powell's house on I-85. You'll be driving through my district to get there. Um, just let me know, and I'll talk to the sheriff's office and Browston Police and Jefferson Police and Commerce Police. Um, I have House Bill 803, and uh, 803 was a uh, uh, the idea of the bill came from some friends of constituent uh, that uh, would require law enforcement agencies to develop a uh, policy on addressing how peace officers uh, uh, handle encounters with domesticated pets. Uh, we'd like to see training provided uh, for these for these officers. Uh, going through the bill real quick. In section one, we've uh, we've got the terms there uh, for animal and peace officer. Um, down on line eight, starting on line eighteen. Uh, we're simply asking that each state, county, and local law enforcement agency develop a written policy uh, that sets forth the manner in which uh, peace officers uh, handle encounters with, with animals and the way in which peace officers shall control and neutralize an animal that has become aggressive. Um, we do have a um, uh, have it in here that Law enforcement agencies which do not comply with the requirements of this code section are subject to the withholding of any state funding or state administered federal funding. We also looked, and we but we did not put it in there in the bill, and would would welcome the uh, the knowledge uh, knowledge of the committee to to help us on this. That any discharge of a weapon that kills an animal uh, be tracked in a publicly accessible database or platform. Um, in Section 2, uh, this, again, defines the terms, but then it's uh, in, uh, in small section, uh, uh, little b, any person employed or appointed as a peace officer has complete training and behavioral characteristics of animals as provided for in the code section. And then we have three training, uh, one, two, and three, basic animal behavioral characteristics, situations and environments. Uh, and ways in which and, and ways in which a peace officer can control and neutralize an animal that is or becomes aggressive in a manner that utilizes the least amount of force or likelihood of harm to the animal. Uh, we have a date, July the 1st of this year, uh, that the council would include the training as provided for in uh, this subsection on any basic training course as provided in the subsection. Candidates who have successfully completed a basic training course and who did not receive the training as provided for in, in this sub in the subsection would have until July the 1st, 2016, to get to complete the training. Um, we have in here that if a peace officer, commission officer, Department of Public Safety, he or she shall complete each training in sessions approved by the commissioner of public safety. 
uh, peace officer shall provide the council with confirmation of training. Failure by any peace officer to compl uh, complete the training as provided by this code section shall result in an emergency suspension of the officer's certification uh, by the executive director of the council. And once that training is, is done, uh, the, the, uh, that would be withdrawn. Training would be one time. Um, we're leaving it up to the council to, uh, to do the training specifications. And I wanted to know, would it be appropriate to add into the bill a policy to uh, investigate firearm discharges as standard operating procedure? Now, the reason for the bill, I personally do not own a, a dog uh, or a cat, um, but the reason for the bill is that uh, in this country there are about... Uh, 77.5 uh, million owned dogs in this country. Um, and about 39% of the time, law enforcement agencies are going to uh, run into uh, an animal uh, at, at any location. Um, the officers routinely deal with, with animals because they have become such a, a normal thing in our, in our daily lives. Officers shoot about 250,000 dogs a year. Um, uh, 50% or more of all shooting incidents in, uh, involving an officer uh, pertains to a dog. Um, every 98 minutes, a dog is shot by law enforcement. And in Georgia, uh, sent, uh, in the years 2010-2012, 100 reported dog shootings by law enforcement in the city of Atlanta uh, or metro Atlanta. There are three states that have mandatory training. Those are Colorado, Tennessee, and Illinois. Uh, three states are working on the legislation. That's California, Texas, and Nevada. Uh, prior to California's Dog Protection Act, three dogs a month were being shot by law enforcement. Since that time, only two dogs have been shot by law enforcement. So we, we see a need for something. Um, it needs to be something that's standardized. Uh, it doesn't need to be that, uh, and, and this is some wording that, uh, some changes in the wording that, that we would welcome that maybe that uh, one set of policies is written for all law enforcement agencies. Uh, that way you don't have uh, the City of Commerce having one policy and the, the City of Atlanta having one and the City of uh, Hay Hire having one. And so uh, those are the reasons for the bill. Be uh, glad to try to answer any questions that, uh, that you have. I have several people that, that are signed up to speak, I think, to, to, come, uh, to speak to you about the measure. Questions? Questions from the committee? Well, we have some people signed up to speak. Mm -hmm. Mr. Independent, would you like to have a seat up here? I'll be glad to. In case you need to answer any of these folks. <clears throat> uh, Kelly Rodriguez, Matthew Rodriguez. Thank you, um, Chairman, Vice Chairwoman, and Representatives. Um, I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> Nothing to worry about. Just pull the microphone a little bit closer. Okay. So, when a husband or a wife lose a spouse, they become a widow. When a child loses his parents, he becomes an orphan. What do you call a parent who loses a child? What term exists to describe a parent whose child is murdered 12, 12 feet away from them? I personally believe that there isn't a term because it's not supposed to happen. In my experience, only feelings can capture this. The first feeling is numbness, which became my emotion for grief after my father died. 
in a car accident when I was 10. This is followed by a continual nightmare, replaying Jane's shooting over and over and over in my head. There's this striking pain that hits my throat every time I realize I am never going to see her again. And finally, there's the terror knowing that I'm going to relive this the rest of my life. This should be the happiest time of my life. We have a perfect son. We just purchased our first home in Grant Park, which we chose due to its fenced in front and backyards and doggy door. But it isn't the happiest time of my life and it's not getting easier with time like so many people assured me that it would. Every time that I look at my son, I'm reminded that he will never remember the sister who loved him unconditionally before he was born. Going back to the shooting, the day was just like any other day. Um, my husband was on a charity bike ride with the South Atlanta Bike Shop, an organization that he had been working with um, since his second year of seminary at McAfee University. So luckily, I got a little more time to lay in bed with Jane before my son George woke up. My brother and his um, niece and nephew were in town. My brother's in the Air Force, so he wasn't able to be there for George's birth on August 7th. So they came down to meet him. We, we got home and they were packing up to leave and my niece's, my niece's phone accidentally died nine, dial 911. When dispatch called back, we confirmed it was accidental. An hour, an hour had passed and the precinct was 0.45 miles from my house. I was upstairs nursing George on our bed with Jane and Lucy playing beside us on the door when I heard a knock. George was asleep, so I hesitated to call down that I was coming, but I did. So then I got up, I laid my son down in his bassinet, I got dressed and I walked downstairs with Lucy and Jane in tow. I opened it, the door, and my world changed. In less than two seconds, Officer Brian Carswell turned around and shot my Jane in the head. At the same time, I was running down my porch steps screaming, no, but it was too late. She was at my feet in a pool of blood. I scooped up Lucy, our five-month-old, 30-pound puppy, while the officer, other officer had his gun trained on her. And I wasn't able to get these in the packets, but these are, these are our dogs, and you can see that one puppy is 30 pounds. Um, I ran up to my bedroom's second floor porch, locked the door, scraping for some semblance of security and I assured Lucy that she was safe. I told my crying son that I would feed him as soon as I could, and I stood on my porch begging and pleading for the officers who still had their guns out to let my neighbors take Jane to the vet. I was paralyzed. My human baby was crying. My canine baby, our firstborn, was laying below me bleeding to death, and all I could do was scream for help, then run back inside to call my crying baby. I distinctly remember jumping up and down with my hands in my face and my eyes closed thinking that somehow that would knock me back into reality because this wasn't reality. Finally, a sergeant arrived and gave my neighbors permission to take Jane to the vet. My husband, who was on the charity bike ride, had to rush immediately to the vet to be with her and I got there at one o'clock. We sat down and we met with the vet who walked us through her treatment plan and asked us to pay $3,000, which we happily paid. At that moment, I, I've never prayed so hard in my life. I sat there and I just prayed and I bargained with God, God, I will, I will give you $20,000. We will move out of this house. We will move back to our apartment in Marietta where we were safe. I will do anything. Just let my baby be okay. She wasn't. If she would have gotten to the vet earlier, if, if the officers would have let my neighbors come get her, she could have lived, but she eventually died of, of swelling of the brain. Every day since November 10th, I relive this, and I even have nightmares of slightly different occurrences. 
In one version, I'm shot. And I sit there and I picture my husband raising my son by, by himself. In another one, I'm carrying him down the stairs like I usually do, and he's shot. And I, I'm sick thinking that what if I had lost my baby and my, and my other canine baby. But at the same time, I have to be strong. I tell myself, you cannot be depressed around your son. As a new parent, I read obsessively about how to be the best mother that I can, and it says, talking about postpartum depression, how you do not want to be sad around a child that can wreak havoc emotionally, developmentally, spiritually. And my son deserves the best, most nurturing environment. He also deserves to grow up with Jane. There are two amazing gifts from God that we're supposed to experience life together. So I just wanted to, I just wanted to share some positives about Jane. Um, she was truly a gift from God. I believe that with every bit of my heart. She came into our lives about a year into my husband Matthew and I's marriage when we were still learning how to go from me to we. Um, but I saw the way Matthew loved her and I was reassured that I married a great father to our future children. Jane gave us the we. We took her everywhere. She came with us to trunk or treat at our church. Being from the north, we, we didn't understand what trunk or treat was. We thought we were we didn't know what we were supposed to do. Apparently, you decorate your trunk, but we just put we just put Jane in the trunk and had kids come give her give her treats and and every single kid just she was so gentle and unfortunately she had a stomach ache when she went home that night because of so many treats. Um, she came on morning trail runs with us. Even if I didn't want to run, I knew that seeing how happy she was bounding through the thickets, I knew that that would start my day off the right way. She came on date night with she came on date nights with us um, that on, to places that allowed dogs. She took us to the dog park with her. She came to bed with us. She oftentimes slept under the covers in between us, and it's like she knew if if we were in a tiff or we were upset with one another because maybe I left the cap off um, the orange juice, which I have a tendency to do. She was basically saying, "Come on, mom," or "Come on, dad." Who cares that mom left the OJ cap off? It's really not important. Um, and then oddly, Jane started spending more and more time with me January, um, just a, just a year ago. Soon after we learned that our first son, George, who's here today was on the way. I then understood why she insisted upon being next to me. She was so excited to meet the new life her parents were bringing into the world. She loved everyone. She was the best family member I could have asked for. And yet, she lived her last moments in needless suffering, desperately trying to figure out what she had done wrong. She lived her last moments alone on an operating table, wondering why we weren't there for her. That thought literally makes me sick. The thought that makes me even more sick is that this happens to 250,000 families in the U.S. and probably 150 in Georgia, and those are reported. So. You know, you, you have the opportunity to, by passing bill, House Bill 803, to put an end to this senseless violence. So please be the leaders that we hope you are. Thank you. Was this the Atlanta Police Department? This was, yes. What, um, ha what happened to the officer involved? Not a thing. I can even go on another, a whole, I, pr I could probably talk for 20 more minutes about that, uh, but I won't. Do you have any idea what justification he gave for shooting the animal? What every single person gives as their justification, okay. they felt threatened. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Any other questions? I might ask what kind of, uh, what was the uh, breed? Um, she was a lab mix. He actually, um, in our research, we've, we've read that oftentimes they, they try to identify the dog as being a pit bull um, because they think that that gives them justification. But a lot of the manuals, like the, um, the Department of Justice put out a manual that, I've, that we've referenced in our handout, and they say that based on the Fourth Amendment lawsuit that they shouldn't try to, to characterize a dog because oftentimes they're wrong. They should try to characterize the dog by their stature, their, their color, um, but he actually did call her a pit bull. Um, 
which our vet, we have vet records that say that she isn't. Thank you, Mr. S um, Chairman. I, I did have a question. How large was this dog? I know you talked about the puppy. The, she was um, 60 pounds. She was 60 pounds. The 30 pounds was your other puppy. 30 pounds was the other puppy. So here's. Okay. Um, I printed these out, but I. There she is. Okay. I can see it. That's okay. good. Yeah. Um, thank you. When she came out the stairs, I mean, was she charging at the office? I mean, she's bouncing down. I mean, I'm I'm trying in my mind to picture what happened. Exactly. I know there's many incidences that we could talk about. But mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. She she was bounding like she okay. was running through the thickets, basically. Okay. So he just misunderstood that she wasn't harming. She was just a jolly puppy dog, whatever, running out there. He must misunderstood, and um, you know that's. That's what we seek to to change. If these officers are here to protect and to serve, I could have easily been shot. There's been cases where children have been shot, where other officers have been shot, where property has been damaged. Can he prove that there that there was no way that I would have been hit? And that's where we're seeking that they use a taser, that they use mace, that they use their bully stick, that they that they use a club, or even as a lot of the dog behavior videos that will show you turning like this is enough to to have a dog stop jumping or run i mean that's what they even teach you when you get home i don't know if any of you have dogs but if your dog's excited you're supposed to just turn around and they're like oh well this isn't fun they're not they're not playing with me okay thank you Do we have anyone else who, and we want to thank you for coming up today. Do we have anyone else who wishes to uh, speak on this issue? Do we have anyone from any of the PD departments? Yes, sir. Come on up. Just introduce yourself, please. Are you? Uh, I'm, you Matthew? I'm Matthew Rodriguez, yeah. So I was the second person signed up. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I wonder if any of you know <clears throat> what it's like to fall in love with a dog at first sight. I do. I wonder if any of you know what it's like to have dreamed about a dog for years, constantly pestering your spouse about it until they're exasperated with you. To have been so excited about your future dog that in mere preparation, you've read several books about how to raise the perfect canine, only to realize that when you finally meet the girl you've dreamed about, that the wait was so worth it. I do. I wonder if any of you know what it's like to spend countless hours training and socializing and walking and running and playing with your dog watching her swim and chase balls and wrestle with other dogs, to have taught her dozens of tricks that you are so proud to show off to each and every visitor your household entertained, to have such a special bond that you never knew you could love an animal to that extent. I do. I wonder if any of you know what it's like to feel so confident in your family's safety when you're not home because you know that your dog would rather die than to let, anyone, to let any harm come to them. I do. I wonder if any of you know what it's like to receive a terrible phone call, alerting you that there's been an accident, that your best friend's been shot in the head. Do you know what it's like to speed to the vet, desperately hoping that you'll be able to see your friend, to offer a comforting word, Do you know what it's like to watch the veterinarian's mouth move as she tries to explain your best friend's condition, but to be able to, unable to hear a word because you're completely numb? I do. I wonder if any of you know 
what it's like to walk back into the operating room and to see what's been done to your baby. To whisper in her ear that you're there for her. And to watch as she tries with all her might to respond to your voice as if you were simply calling her from the backyard. I wonder if you like know what it's like to hope for your best friend's recovery while all the while understanding that she's just not going to make it. I do. I wonder if any of you know what it's like to be ushered into a bereavement room and have your best friend's lifeless body rolled into the room. To curl up beside her on a metal table to smell the sweet, disgusting smell of her fresh wounds. To stain yourself in your clothes with her matted blood. To be unclear how long you should stay with her until you say your final goodbye. Well, I do. And so do thousands and thousands of pet owners in Georgia. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, this is not merely a feel-good bill. Officers came to my house after a confirmed accidental 911 call. This was not a no-knock warrant. They were not looking for drugs. They were not trying to break up a dog fighting ring. On a Sunday morning at 11 o'clock in a residential neighborhood, they knocked, attempted to walk away, and as my wife opened the door, and the dog ran down to them with her entire body wagging. They shot her point blank in the head. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a public safety issue. Our communities, uh, these kind of events cause our communities to lose trust in law enforcement, to feel that there's no lack of oversight, and to see person after person, including the 300-pound probation officer down in Albany who shot a 12-pound Jack Russell and claimed that he feared for his life and have that be justified. Um, I just want to reiterate what my wife said. Um, you can help bring an end to this violence against, do against dogs, against our pets, against our family. Um, and uh, and really quick, I, I wanted to share a note that the friend of mine who, who found Jane sent to me um, the day after uh, I, I wrote a, a tribute letter to Jane. Matthew, I know this note won't change anything, but I did want to share it with you. Jane touched so many lives. If it doesn't help or it's too soon, please dismiss it. The last thing I want to do is pile on the emotions in a negative way. When Jane showed up on my doorstep, it didn't occur to me at the time what a miracle she was. Out of the millions of doorsteps in Atlanta, she found her way to us. Undernourished, scared, and having recently chewed through the rope that was tied around her neck, she instantly touched my heart. You may or may not know this, but I spent most of my life being scared of dogs. When I was seven, I was accidentally bit in the face by a golden retriever who was just wanting to play. As a seven-year-old, a bite from a, from a nice dog, and she was, but I was seven, set me back, and it literally took me years to get over this fear. Eventually, I worked up to a level of tolerance. Jane sitting there terrified on my doorstep was the window my heart needed to make room for dogs. As Jessica cared for her while we looked for a home, I would come visit and play some. I even gave Jane a bath. There was no way that dog was getting turned out onto the street or given to a shelter even if it meant I had to keep her. She taught me more lessons on compassion in a couple short weeks than I can count. My heart broke for her. When Jessica told us that you were going to take her, I couldn't have been happier. Y'all made perfect parents for Jane. I didn't see Jane often after that, but I didn't need to. She has, and will always have, a special place in my heart, and I knew she was in the perfect place. It is largely because of Jane that Tori and I own a dog today. I hugged Yachty extra close last night and wept for our dear Jane. Jane touched so many lives, mine included. 
The window that she opened in my heart has changed me for the better and made room in my life for a rescue of our own. My prayers are with you, Kelly, George, and Lucy. I pray for healing, for fond memories, and for the future. I say with all sincerity, I love you. Matthew, thank you for playing a role in opening my heart. Jane will be missed. She was a special dog, a miracle dog. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. <clears throat> Any questions? Thank you so much. And we have a Allison Ritter. Hello. Um, my name's Allison. I'm a really good friend of the Rodriguez family. I've known them for about four years. I work with Kelly. Um, and I'm also a fellow dog owner. I've had a dog since I was, I think, five years old. Um, grew up with two my whole life. Um, and as soon as Jane came into their lives, I, I'm also a fellow runner, and we would run together with Jane. And I did remember her excitable attitude, um, but it was always playful. And, and just hearing her story, and I remember the morning when it happened, um, it just surprised me that that the first course of action was so aggressive. Um, and this bill would mean to simply put in place other, other ways to react that, like, like Kelly noted, don't have to result in such a tragedy. Um, I'm, I was surprised that that kind of stuff wasn't already in place. But just knowing, just knowing them as a family, knowing that dog, and knowing that she wasn't aggressive in any way, and that I'm sure so many things like this happen that are misinterpreted. Um, I'm su again, I'm surprised that so much of this happens all the time, and nothing's nothing's occurred, um, and legally, for it to to be to stop occurring the way it has been. So um, I'm just here on behalf of my friends as a fellow dog owner, and. Um, I really hope that something can, can come from this. So thank you. Thank you. Any questions? No. Thank you. <sighs> Colonel, would you like to? Uh... Since you're the, you seem to be the only law enforcement presence here today, possibly address part of this and not certainly not all parts of it, but. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Shadow, our yellow lab, after 15 years, died this year. Uh, I'm a dog owner, and uh, our family has seen the benefit uh, of a dog uh, in a rural setting. I can't speak for all law enforcement, but I can speak for the troopers, uh, that troopers have to make split decisions every day, split-second decisions. And what might be characterized as playful uh, could be interpreted as aggressive. And so uh, as you consider this bill, uh, understand that for us it's in the details, in particularly in the training. Uh, because with training, a lot of times goes costs of equipment if, you know, that is something that's suggested in the training. Uh, we have a hard enough time uh, dealing with uh, reading people, let alone uh, domesticated animals. And so uh, the details of the length of the training, what would be required, are things that uh, we would ask you to consider. Um, we have very few things also uh, that end up having an emergency removal of post-certification if that training is not met. Uh, and there's a cost that's associated uh, with this as well. So um, to the Rodriguez's circumstances, I can't speak to that. Uh, one of our core values is compassion in our agency. And any time that there's a discharge of a firearm, we investigate it. Uh, we do have a policy uh, that is specific to uh, the use of uh, deadly force, and that is the same for any citizen, the protection of the officer, his life uh, or the life of another. And so in that split-second decision, having to read, uh, you know, uh, what might be considered playful to one, 
uh, and understanding to other is difficult for an officer. So that needs to be considered uh, whatever road uh, that uh, you all decide to go down. But uh, if it is post-certified training, uh, we'd like to have input into that. Uh, and, of course, we would abide by the wishes of the legislature if this is passed. Uh, but understand, it's a difficult job uh, reading uh, humans, uh, let alone domesticated uh, animals. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Did I understand that you said any time there's a discharge of a firearm, there's an investigation? In our agency, yes. Uh, I think the comment was made by the representative also about uh, policies. And uh, I, I would not want uh, the restriction of a one-size-fits-all policy uh, because uh, I, I may want it to be more restrictive depending upon what you come up with uh, in the governing of how we would deal with our troopers, how we would deal with the aspect of it. But, yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, when a trooper discharges his firearm, even if it's to humanely put down an animal that's been struck in the roadway, uh, whenever uh, there's a discharge of a firearm, there's an associated investigation to ensure that there was proper policy and that they did what they were supposed to do correctly. Representative Atwood. Uh, one of the things I put down when I was listening to the testimony and I was trying to work through this bill, too, I, I put, should the training course be certified by post? Absolutely. And if so, what is the mem minimum number of hours? My concern was coming from I want this legislation, I don't want somebody just calling a police officer into, into a room and pencil whipping the training. Right. I want at least a bare minimum of training specified exactly what training you're going to give them. If you give more than that, fine, but at least give them that. And uh, that's my thoughts. And In my opinion, uh, it should be post-certified, mm -hmm. uh, and we would do this in an earned service fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, and to me, this is a subject that could probably co be covered uh, adequately in about two hours. Mm -hmm. right. Questions from anyone else? All righty. Colonel, have you got anything else you want to address right now? No, sir. I'm sure, of course, being the, our preeminent uh, state uniformed agency, I'm sure that local agencies have different standards, which we need to hear from them at some point. But one, one other question. Representative Atwood. I'm sorry, I don't want to keep burdening this. I noticed on line 18 and 2 that we have each state, county law enforcement agency. I, I was. And this is a question, maybe, Colonel, you can answer it. Uh, are there law enforcement entities that were not capturing by that definition, there such are, as police, uh, the police officers that serve on the, on the campuses of our colleges, that serve marshals, our schools, the marshals, things like that, that serve the civil papers sometimes? Are we missing them? I, I think in particularly the marshals because the marshals deal with a lot of code enforcement specifically. Mm -hmm. So when you have those folks that interact with homeowners on sewer issues or water issues, setback issues, all that type of stuff, uh, the marshals are not mentioned in there. In particularly the language that's in there for our department, it talks about commissioned officers. That is a very small, uh, it by definition, group within our agency. If you're going to properly capture that, it needs to be all sworn members of the Department of Public Safety. Because the way that it's written would only be our lieutenants, captains, majors, and above, and would not capture the bulk uh, of our agency. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do you know of any current programs where they have this type of training? Is there something we can mirror or review? Um, is anybody doing anything like this now? To my knowledge, I don't know. I can't tell you that. All right. Thank you. Any other questions of the Colonel? Colonel, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Did you wish to uh, come up and be heard? Good afternoon. Um, in answer to you, I'm Amy, by the way, but in answer to that question that you just asked the officer, uh, and I, I believe um, – um, it was already mentioned earlier, but it, it is uh, in Tennessee, Illinois, and in Colorado, they do have programs that are already 
um, in effect for training the police for training the officers. And how roughly how, how long those courses are roughly? Um, they're not long. Um, I'm I'm not sure. Uh, you check. Yeah, we could check on that. It, it is. Um, they have uh, you know already established it, so we can get the facts on that. Um, like I said, my name is Amy. I um, met the Rodriguez's um, the day that Jane was shot. Um, I have uh, I operate a business called the Atlanta Animal Ambulance, and um, when Jane was shot, I was called by their neighbor, uh, who was desperately trying to seek uh, medical attention for Jane, um, and uh, he Googled. Uh, somebody that might have some kind of uh, influence to uh, allow the officer to release Jane to go get medical attention. Uh, unfortunately, the system is also set up that they had to wait for, uh, I believe, a sergeant to arrive before they could even address Jane. So during that time frame, which was more than 10 minutes, um, Jane's uh, swelling continued to increase, which um, could very well have been a different outcome otherwise. Um, they finally released uh, Jane and allowed her to be driven to the hospital. Uh, and um, uh, you know the results from there. However, um, I wanted to mention uh, some of the statistics that the hospital um, gave us. And uh, this is the emergency hospital in Decatur called Decatur Village Vets. And in the last three years, uh, they've seen more than a dozen shootings uh, in their hospital alone, uh, police related. Um, th they said that the police have never followed up with the hospital about the shooting cases to see about the animal's outcomes. And there's a group called Pities in the City, and they've had five resident dogs in the last year and a half shot and killed just in Fulton County alone. Uh, many of the shootings go unreported due to the lack of resource and the education of most of the owners. Most of the shootings are also unprovoked shootings. The dogs are not showing signs of aggressions, but the officers still choose to shoot. Which leads me to um, my next point is I also have worked hand in hand alongside police officers. I have um, experience as an animal control officer and mm -hmm have worked very closely with police officers on many cases involving animals. And from my personal experience, I'd like to share that uh, officers talk openly about their lack of training in regards to animals. They often are mocking animals and displaying uh, little or no care when it comes time to draw their guns. Uh, it, it, it's it's almost a joke sometimes to them. Um, so it, what I've noticed and what I'd like to share from my experience is that oftentimes other resources can be used besides pulling a gun. Uh, officers are equipped with oftentimes tasers. Um, it's proven that strobe lighting will deter a dog. Uh, they have their aspatons. Um, and I've, I've spoken, like I said, to several police officers who have always used uh, an aspiton or something to deter any kind of um, potential hazard. Um, and there's other ones that just choose to use their guns. Um, I know that they get training as far as prejudices with other types of people. Uh, they have training with prejudices that regard to people's sexuality and gender, but there is no training in reference to animals that they might encounter. Uh, Having worked with animals my whole life, I know that a lot can be learned from just studying and having a, a class on, on body language, um, learning the difference between an animal's excitement and an aggressive animal. So um, it is, it, in all the research that I've done, um, it shows that there has never been an officer killed by a dog. Uh, so that's pretty, um, that's, I think that's a powerful statement. 
Um, the money that I heard, I heard somebody mention, uh, ask earlier how much it would cost for training. Uh, the funding would be very minimal. Uh, there's no new weapons involved for the officers. There's no new purchasing involved. They pretty much have everything they need. They just need to be educated. It's just a mental, it's really a mental um, thing. So I don't think it would cost much money. And um, they pretty much have all the tools that they need except the decision-making process on how to decide whether or not um, uh, if they're, the situation they're in is really, you know, requires force. So um, with that said, I, I just encouraged, uh, you know, education and uh, proper training to make our homes safer and animals safer and people safer. That's all. Hi, thanks for hearing me. Um, I'm Susan. I'm here as a concerned citizen. I didn't know the Rodriguez's before this happened. And I, I first want to say I have utmost respect for the police. I, I never would want to do that job. I know that they're worried that in this situation they might not just be worried about a dog, but some crazy with a gun around the corner. And I do understand that. However, as a homeowner and a dog owner, I just feel with everything I've learned, I might be afraid to call the police if I heard someone trying to break in or something like that and fear that my dog would get shot or that I might get shot. And I don't think it's unreasonable to ask that just a look, some sort of training on dog behavior. I wasn't always a dog person. And once I learned dog behavior, I found that it's easier to predict what they're going to do than what people are going to do. Much simpler. It, Humans are the ones I'm more afraid of. Um, so with all due respect to our police forces and our officers out there who are trying to protect us, I just hope we can do something to promote their education regarding this matter. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, ma'am. Uh, do we have anyone else that would like to be heard? No? Representative Benton? Might not make a suggestion. Oh, excuse me, we do have a. Uh, oh, for the representative. For the representative Benton. Okay. <coughs> representative Benton, if I might make a suggestion, and you know, I think we all know the, that uh, you know the stress and the, and a lot of the uh, the pressures that come upon law enforcement officers, and uh, you know, of course, certainly the colonel can address his agency. I think that we need to probably hear from some other folks. Uh, I'd recommend, and if you need some help, uh, we'll get our intern to help you with this, and that would be to get, uh, oh, Frank Redundo with the Chiefs Association, Terry Norris with the Sheriff's Association, and probably some of the other folks. I'd also like to get the, uh, who's had a uh, post now, Ken, uh, Vance. Ken Vance still down there? Maybe get Ken Vance, uh, get our former colleague, uh, Mr. Benton, uh, Mr. Bearden. Uh, uh, maybe get them to come forward. I think that the, uh, you know, I can understand the emotions. Quite frankly, y'all are better people than I am, but I can also understand the emotion if, if somebody shot my old bulldog. I mean, you know, we become very attached to our pets. And I can certainly understand that. I didn't realize this was as prevalent of a problem, but I guess it must be. And I'm thinking that, you know, one, and the colonel addressed it, it would be a tough road to hoe for us to rewrite all the training manuals or and reschedule training. But I think there's such a thing as there's a way that it might could be done either through uh, talking to all the various folks about policies, about adopting policies or standards uh, that it could be integrated in as opposed to just changing the whole system overnight, possibly. 
and um, but I think it would take a sit down meeting with those folks and if you'd like for us to implement that with our intern to get these folks to sit down at a meeting and we'll make any of the committee members here make them uh, make that meeting be known to them if they'd like to sit involved be involved in it and uh, sit down and just see I mean we understand you know, it's not a pleasant thing to talk about. You know, quite frankly, I'm sure that there are probably law enforcement folks who just soon, soon shoot an animal if they have a fear. Uh, quite frankly, the dogs don't bother me near as much as some of the people do, but I don't put a boa constrictor out in front of me. <laughs> I mean, I know some people love the snakes, but you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not part of that group. Uh, but anyway, that being said, if you'd consider doing that, and uh, any of the members that would like to work with Representative Benton, trust me, he's a pretty nice guy. I mean, despite despite uh, despite his sense of humor at times. And um, but I think this is something have some that would be worthwhile to uh, to look at. And that being said, does anyone have anything they'd like to? Anybody got anything on the chest they want to bear? Well, then I'll give some of y'all a little bit to the committee members that are here in attendance. Let me tell you what the committee's in for. You'll more than likely have a uh, law enforcement second, second Amendment bill, another Second Amendment bill coming of a pretty major proportion. I think everybody has seen this. We had uh, you know, excess of numerous hours last year on it. Uh, this is a cleaned up version. It should be a little bit easier. Uh, quite frankly, we've got uh, we've got a lot of people who stated their Second Amendments, but because of the, some of the parts of it last year, they couldn't vote for it. Well, if they're Second Amendments, I think they can certainly vote for this bill that'll be coming this year. But we won't be letting uh, we won't be dragging our feet on that bill. There's another major bill that, because uh, all bills are pretty impor are important, but we have another bill that we're going to have to deal with post haste, and that is the private probation bill has been assigned to this committee. Uh, as y'all may know, the judges, for y'all, some of y'all who kept up with it, the judges have uh, issued some adverse rulings uh, on private probation due to, in fact, that maybe some of the private companies might have gotten a little bit out of hand at times about how they were charging on the private probation stuff. This is a bill that we're going to be dealing with there, as well as a numerous other bills. By my calculations, uh, you know, we've got whew, 38 days left in the session. Is that correct? Excuse me, 28 days left now? So I figure by those calculations that we could very well have maybe another 30 or 40 Second Amendment gun bills that come up by then. And that being said, I want to thank you all for uh, the com committee members for being here today. And I want to thank everybody in the audience for being here. And we have, have had one of our colleagues that has shown up. You just wanted to see how real real meetings are handled. I understand. <laughs> well, you know, if I had to take a bet, I bet you wouldn't have to go far. <laughs> I want to thank everyone. Be careful going home. Thank you.